A warm welcome to CEDA. Uh, and a warm welcome to the Swedish launch of the IFAD 2019 Rural Development Report called Creating Opportunities for Rural Youth. We are honored to have you here, Mr. President. Gilbert, I hope I pronounced it right, F. Ongbo, President of IFAD. Welcome back to CEDA and welcome to Sweden. We are here to discuss an important issue and to listen to an important presentation. 42% of the world's population are under the age of 25. Of these, almost 1 billion youth live in low-income countries and nearly half of them in rural communities. Unlocking the potential of rural youth is key to sustainable development, to sustainable development everywhere and for everyone. Swedish Development Corporation aims at eradicating poverty. Eradicating poverty and always having a focus on the vulnerable and the most marginalized groups. And finding ways of investing in and providing opportunities to the large youth population is increasingly, is thus rather increasingly an important target for us here at CEDA. Today, 10 of our bilateral strategies for development cooperation explicitly target youth and rural youth. By empowering youth in all aspects of the development of, development of the society, we contribute to sustainable development. Youth represents, I would like to stress again, an untapped economic as well as social poten potential. We work in different ways. CEDA works for employment and income generation, for education and voca vocational training. For instance, in countries like Kenya, Liberia, Rwanda, Somalia, Zimbabwe and Tanzania, CEDA provides substantial support to interventions for skills development, enterprise development, as well as job creation especially targeting youth. But, however, we also, we very much recognize the need of investing in other dimensions of youth empowerment, such as uh, improved health, increased voice, and increased political participation for the young, for the youth population in all countries, and especially so at local level. Given the large challenge, but also recognizing all of the opportunities, the IFED report, with its focus on how we can create opportunities for rural youth, is very timely. So thank you again for being here. And my last words will again be warmly welcome to CEDA and to this afternoon. And Kaisa, today's moderator, Kaisa, you want, you want on you are welcome back to CEDA. Thank our former much. board member. Yes, thank but you very welcome. much. Welcome, thank you. Yes, so I got the, the honor to be today's uh, moderator. And I should first inform you that this event is being filmed. It's being filmed by CEDA and by IFAD. And we have the obligation to, to inform everybody about that. And also to say that it's a co-arrangement between uh, CIDA, CIANI and, and IFAD. And all three organizations are really happy to, to see you all here. We know we all have busy weeks coming back after our summer holidays. And also, we also have some farmers here. And we're especially glad to have them here, given that it's also harvest time. Not a very good time for, no, for a seminar on agriculture and rural development. I uh, also want to stress we're going to, uh, to get the, the presentation of the report. We also have some copies of it. And I also want to stress it's the, the full report is quite lengthy, but I don't see there is no excuse that we shouldn't read or consume at least part of it. There's a summary, there's an overview. Siani has one summary on their webpage, and IFAD also has a video overview and summary. So there are different ways of at least getting some parts of what's in this really important report. 
My background is uh, in Swedish development cooperation. I've been working in rural areas, mostly with uh, popular mobilization, with cooperatives and farmers and peasants union, mostly in Southern Africa, but also in, in Afghanistan. And one of the issues that I have been working with, both here in Sweden, actually living in, in a rather rural area, but also in development cooperation, is the inclusion of, of young people in social movements, in organizations, and in their more participatory democracy. And with the risk of maybe offending the coming speakers, one of the issues that is some, sometimes hampering youth participation and active agency is the role of rather people of a certain age, of a bit of an advanced age. And this report focused mainly on the more technical aspects of youth agency and of youth opportunities. But I also think these social relations and the power aspects of them are really important. And just a small, like a, a memory of mine from standing exactly here by this table eight years ago. And then I could at least almost call myself a young person. I don't think I qualify for that anymore. And I was invited to comment on the then re like the recently released FAO guidelines on uh, governance of forestry, land and fisheries. And uh, in the panel, there were only men and men of a certain age, maybe yeah, quite a lot more than my, my own. And I felt very little and I started to doubt, what am I doing here? What should I contribute with? What should I say in this panel of all these like distinguished guests? And then as, as always, and I still do that, I talked about peasants and farmers, like the, the, the impressions, everything that I heard from them working in the field. So I shared some of the, the impressions of that. And one of the other panelists was a person who's actually in the room now. It was one of IFAD's former president, Lennart Båge. And when I saw his name, I was like, what am I going to do here standing next to IFAD's president? I just came back from six years under a mango tree. So what will be my contribution? And what Lennart did after the, after the panel was to come over to me and to greet me and to thank me and to be very humble and encouraging. And I also think this, this is a good example of when the older generation can be really supportive and be the ones enabling the young generation, or at least the younger, as I wasn't that young at that time, to take, to take space, to, to be agents. And as much as we talk increasingly about the, the importance of men promoting and working for gender equality, I think it's also important to underline the need to talk about older people and the revolutionary elders in promoting young people's participation. And just a quick note also on participation agency and representation. I think it's, it's a bit ironic that we will have a panel here today discussing a report where the main characters are the uh, young people uh, aged 15 to 24 in the south. And we have very little representation of that group in the panel. We also have, in comparison to the, to the, to the, to the topic, a quite an old panel. Uh, slightly more than 46 years of mean age, which is 20 years more than what the limit for, for being young. I'm sure they will all have really important contributions though. Uh, doing my field work in, in Mozambique, I'm, I'm also doing my PhD thesis. Um, I'm working, I'm studying the peasants movement and I'm talking a lot with peasants again. And when you meet young people studying and the uh, the parents of young people studying and you ask like what's their motivation to go to school many times the answer is to become someone and when you ask then what it means to become someone in that setting it means not to have to be a farmer and then you try to understand so what is it that they don't want to be what is it with the farmer being that they don't want to be it's not about like the lack of linkage and the importance of agriculture. It's not like about a missing link to land and, and culture and, and, and their ancestors. It's more about not wanting to be a part of what is always neglected in policy, what is not given priority and what is not given a high status in society. And I think that it highlights, and it, this is also why I think that this report is really important. It highlights the global opportunities for youth development, for youth to be able to take part. But it also highlights many of the risks that we see. 
that rather than if we don't make the youth, the rural youth, being able to make use of these opportunities, they risk becoming even more behind, to be even more so the behind people. And I think that that is not only in the South, it's also in Sweden. A couple of weeks ago, I read in my local newspapers called Jotining, it's quite a rural area, that there was a headline, the state has abandoned you. And then the content was that there is not one single state representation left in that municipality or district, except from Systembolaget, which is the state's uh, liquor monopoly. So that's the only state uh, representation in that area. So I think when we talk about these things, it's not only about talking about things happening somewhere else, it's also taking the discussion to countries like Sweden, maybe for us to look at, at countries like Norway approaching rural development, rural opportunities and rural youth in a quite a different way. I think one of the, some final words, and one of the main, the most important contributions of the report has to do with when it discusses the specific, like how we create like the specific opportunities for youth, but also the general, the importance of a general investment in rural development. And I think it's really important because it locates the change for one group, the youth, a rather large and, and diverse group, in a context, and it challenges us to keep both the context and a specific group in mind at the same time. And it can sound quite obvious, but I think as development practitioners, we many times fail to do so. We believe that if we make a certain investment with a very specific program in one target group, that target group will kind of pull itself up by the bootstraps, despite all the challenges in the context. So I think that is one, and I'm looking forward to hear the presentation discussing that too, because I also think that that is something really important that we as development practitioners can uh, take from, from this report. Uh, and with those words, I would like to invite the president of, of IFA, Gilbert Humbo, to give us some words, and after that we will have uh, uh, Paul Winters presenting the report. But please, come. Um, thank you so much, uh, and dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, let me extend my uh, welcome to um, all of you. I just felt that uh, I should not take too much time so we can have more time to the presentation and the substantive um, discussion but it will really be, um, I will have failed um, if I don't take a um, few minutes just to express our appreciation and our thanks uh, um, to Sida and the Director uh, um, General uh, Karim Jamtin for really helping us organizing on this uh, um, idea uh, launch uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And also use this uh, um, few minutes to highlight uh, IFAD and uh, Sweden um, collaboration, which obviously um, goes back to the to the to the to the forty uh, the forty years. And uh, particular thanks also um, to to Lena Bogi that you know has uh, not only has uh, shaped up uh, um, IFAD but has also been very instrumental in presenting IFAD uh, in, uh, in, in, in Sweden and a lot of uh, um, other countries that I wanted to express our appreciation um, for that. Um, there's uh, so many um, activity in addition to um, uh, um, Sweden being uh, one of our key uh, partners, not, uh, not in, uh, only in terms of uh, um, contribution or as a donor, but also helping us shaping the directions that uh, we take in, as well as the similarity uh, about the, uh, the, the, for the, the area of focus. You might wish to remember that the four mainstream, uh, mainstreaming um, idea, um, focus that uh, IFAD is pursuing and since uh, our current cycle is one is gender, second is uh, nutrition, third is climate change, and fourth is youth. Obviously, the presentation today is going to be on youth, but you always have to look at that, and I'm sure Paul will touch on that, uh, not on isolated manner, but uh, integrated in those um, four uh, mainstreaming um, focus uh, item of uh, of us. Even on the uh, on the, on the bilateral, uh, a lot of activities that Sida uh, um, is, uh, um, um, you know, some you know. If I in French is FIDA, so sometimes I confuse the S and the F. So um, 
data, a, a lot of uh, um, activities that uh, you help us also, and we are doing. Uh, I just want to highlight one that I believe is uh, um, with the same activity we are addressing or killing so many, uh, um, um, uh, achieving so many objectives by the same uh, by the same stone. Um, one is the rural women economic empowerment. Uh, not only we are focusing on the women, but we are focused on the economic dimension and bringing together four agencies at the same time, um, which is FAO, WFP, IFAT, and UN, uh, UN, uh, UN Women. The, I also wanted to, um, to, 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 to highlight the uh, importance of uh, um, the Swedish government playing in the, what do you call our ASAP program, which is an adaptation for uh, smallholders uh, program, which is another important dimension that we are really, we count on your um, expertise and being uh, very active in the in, in the uh, in the governance uh, um, structure of ASAP, uh, which is another quite um, very uh, very critical. The third, and why I'm using the, this third example, is to see the innovation dimension that we see in our cooperation, which is a program uh, which we call Insured. As you know very well, um, as we move forward uh, in terms of. Uh, um, um, the agribusiness, when you look at that, how to integrate, we talk about the youth, we're going to talk about um, food, food security or, or insecurity and the nutrition, yes, but all of that has to be put in the concept of uh, agribusiness, in the concept of developing the economic side of it, uh, bringing the youth to really embrace the activity as an economic, uh, uh, as a decent uh, living um, uh, activity. So. To, and therefore, the, the, the insurance uh, um, dimension is one of the major challenges that we have before, uh, um, before us, uh, um, particularly uh, in terms of um, insurance against uh, um, extreme uh, weather conditions and the impact it can have on, uh, uh, on smallholders uh, um, particular, uh, in particular. So I just use those few examples to really um, express uh, um, our um, appreciation of uh, the role that you play in. And, and I want to finish on this uh, point. Obviously, I'm talking here about, uh, about IFAD, but I think it's important to take the work that IFAD is trying to do in the context of the whole global um, SDGs. Um, IFAD, we are one of. And so it's, it's not only to talk about IFAD here. I would really like to talk more about how do we handle the rural youth be it IFAD, be it uh, other colleagues uh, in the whole uh, development, multilateral, um, bilateral, the private sector, the, the, the foundation, and the research um, on the academia uh, pers perspective. So uh, with that, let me stop here and say a big thank you again for coming this afternoon. Thank you. Yes, so then uh, I would like to, to welcome Paul Winters to the stage and he is the one who's going to uh, give us the presentation, some, some highlights from the, uh, from the report. Would you like to press yourself or should I? I'll do it. No. You have to... Yes. Okay. Do I turn this on? I think it. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, before I start, a, a couple things. First, the, the comment on, on young people and involvement in the port, I'm one of those old people uh, that's, that was in charge ultimately of the port. It was a big challenge. Uh, and we noticed that in the very first meeting we had, the young people were the research assistants, uh, which we have a lot of, and they were in the meeting, but it was very challenging. And we tried to, to go out and look for, for younger researchers, because this was, this was formed by about 20 papers, background papers, that were done by researchers around the world. Um, and in the end, we got some, but it was challenging. And part of the challenge is that uh, young researchers are not working enough, in my mind, on food systems. That we see them working in other sectors, the ones that are working in development. And agriculture has become viewed as less important. Uh, and it's unfortunate at this time, because uh, if you read the IPCC report from last week, 
food security is directly linked to our management of the land, of climate, uh, of everything. Um, so it was challenging. In the end, one of the key writers of the report was a postdoc, but that was the best we could do, a German postdoc, unfortunately not from a developing country. Uh, but it was very challenging. We did make sure that in the review, since, uh, since we have a strong youth program, it was all reviewed by young people. Uh, we got their feedback. Uh, in our panel in Rome, we made sure there were young people that came from developing countries. But I do think it's a legitimate point. And one of the points that we're making in the report itself is that young people need to be engaged in decision making. Uh, and one thing you, wa you want to avoid is having the young people segmented from decision making and say, over there is the Ministry of Youth and that's their problem. In fact, you want them to be integrated into that decision making. Um, then the second thing is, uh, before I start, I just wanted to tell a quick story about uh, a young Swede, uh, Agda Eriksson. So Agda Eriksson was, um, was born in a place called uh, Ersta, that's near Vesteris. Uh, I'm sure I'm saying this wrong, east of Vesteris. Uh, she was born in 1894, I mean 1884. Um, she was born to uh, a, a woman who uh, worked on a farm, but was a servant on that farm. The mother was unmarried, so she was poor. Uh, she herself ended up being a maid in the household. And then in 1902, she had to make a decision what she was gonna do. And her decision was to get on a boat in Vesteris. And that decision brought her to America. On that boat, she met Andrew Pearson. Uh, who was going to end up being her husband, and they together went to Omaha, Nebraska. So 18 and 24 years old. They, of course, then had a, a child, Mabel Pearson, who I called Grandma, and uh, who made delicious Swedish meatballs, way better than you ever get at Ikea. Now, the point is, is that a lot of countries go through this transition. They have this period of time where, where opportunities are limited. And so 18, 24 year olds, they had to make decisions about their future. And one of the things about youth, which we debated a great deal, what makes young people different? Why are they separate? Why are they a category into themselves? And a part of it is that they are doing that transition between youth or being a child and being an adult. That creates huge opportunities, but also enormous challenges. And so what we want to do is try to think is, how do we address those challenges? Uh, oh, here it is. Thanks. So right now in the world, uh, the, if you go by the UN definition, there's 1 billion uh, young people in developing countries. About half of those are by government definitions in rural areas. What we did is we looked at using GIS data about population densities in rural areas. And so we looked also at semi-urban and, uh, well, peri-urban areas, the semi-rural areas. And what we come up with is 780 million rural young people in developing countries. And the number that's growing tremendously. Right now, about 65% of them are in Asia and the Pacific region. And about 20% are in Sub-Saharan Africa. By 2050, 37% will be in Sub-Saharan Africa. Asia Pacific will be about 50%. So we see this enormous growth in Sub-Saharan Africa of young people. Where are those young people? The majority are in poor countries or countries with high population rates. So if you look at this graph, we have gross national income on the bottom axis. And then on the, on the vertical axis, we have the rural poverty rate. And so what you see is that right now, there's a big chunk of people. The bubble is the number of millions of people in there. There's a big chunk in the lower middle income countries, some of the upper middle income countries. But where all the growth is, is in these areas that are much poorer. Now this shouldn't be too surprising and one of the things that makes sense when you think about it. Where are fertility rates the highest? Where people are poorest. Where are people the poorest? In poorer countries. Within poor countries, where are the people even poorer? In rural areas. The fertility rates are highest in areas that are dominated by agriculture and the most rural areas. So one of the key conclusions of this is that is where the growth is going to be. That's where we're going to continue to have young people. So what are we going to, to do to help them? The first uh, was to think about, well, what do they need? Productivity. They need to be able to be productive. I saw this on panels. Uh, I've been on a number of panels with, with youth where I'm the one old person with a whole bunch of young people. 
Um, and they talk about this all the time, the need to be productive, to be able to contribute. But they also need to be connected. So they need to have access to networks, to phones, to roads, all of these other things that allow them to take advantage of the opportunities of being productive. If you're productive, but you have no way to access markets, it doesn't do you a lot of good. They also need agency. They need to be able to be empowered. They need to be able to do things for themselves. So if this is what we're after, then what do we need to consider? The first thing is the setting in which they reside. It matters a great deal what country they live in. How structurally transformed is that country? How important is agriculture? How important is the rural economy? Within that country, where do they live in the country? Are they in a peri-urban area? Are they out in a more remote area? Within that area, what kind of household are they in? Are their parents own a small business or are they subsistence farmers? Where you start from matters a great deal. As I said with Agda, her family, her parents worked on a farm and she was a, an employee of that farm. That's where she was starting from and did not see a great deal of opportunity going forward. The second is what are the specific constraints young people face? Are they different from older people? Is it a special category of person that you have to think about? And then the third thing is to consider both of these things under today's unprecedented dynamic nature of change. Now, all of our countries have gone through some sort of demographic transition. We had a time when there was lots of young people, but the speed at which that is occurring is much faster than it was in the past. So going through each of these. So what we did is we looked at structural transformation. How important is agriculture within the economy? As countries grow, we know agriculture becomes less important in terms of the overall gross domestic product. Services industry get more important. So how structurally transformed? And then in rural areas, what you expect is productivity to increase. The value of production to increase, you get an agriculture that's vibrant, that has high productivity. So we put all the countries on this graph and you see countries that have high structural transformation, their economies are more developed, and the rural areas are also more developed. Those value chains are really well developed, they're, they're uh, much stronger. And what we find though, is 75% of young people are in these countries. So again, in these countries, fertility rates have declined. They've gone through more of a demographic transition. In these countries, they haven't. And we end up with a lot of people that are in the more remote rural areas. So the country, so we have to think, when we wanna address the youth problem, the youth issue, then we have to think of rural areas in these countries that are less transformed. What about where they are within those countries? Now here we used uh, the EVI, which I can't remember, the vegetative index. So again, using mapping to see what is the agricultural potential. So over here is more agricultural potential. And then using that population density, what's the commercial potential? Is there potential to sell? What we find is that among young people, 67%, two thirds of them are in each areas with agricultural potential, meaning that they could produce. The problem is, is that only a third of those, or 25% in total, are in areas with commercial potential. So even if they can produce, it's hard for them to sell. So it creates a challenge and a lot depends on where they are within a country. And then where are they, what are they going to do given what their parents have done? So here's what their parents potentially do. They're subsistence farming, they specialize in farming, so they're not just producing, but they're selling. They're a transitioning household, they're somewhere in between non-farm and farm activities. They're a diversified household uh, in which they've clearly diversified different types of activities, and we have technical definitions for all of these, and we have non-farm uh, household. Now, the three uh, that are in green here, well, sorry, the two here are basically agricultural activities. If someone is a, comes from a subsistence farm, they have a two-thirds chance they're gonna stay on the farm. And a large majority of them are actually going to be agricultural workers. So 90% chance, if you come from a subsistence farm, you're going to stay in that area. Uh, but even as you go to these other categories, 
Young people in rural areas tend to still focus on agriculture and when you look more carefully on industries linked to agriculture, the value chain, the food system. And so if we want to, if we have that 75% of young people in these low transformed areas, but and their, their employment is almost all going to be linked to agriculture, their development is going to be linked to the agricultural sector. Now, that's the context in which they operate, which matters. Now, they also face particular constraints. The capacities and skills. Now, the, the World Bank put out this great report called The Changing Nature of Work. And one of the things that it says is the importance now of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. And when, I, as I said, on the panels I've been with young people, this gets them, uh, you know, they come and talk to me afterwards as soon as I make this statement. Because they recognize that the cognitive skills, the things we normally learn in universities, you know, all those math, all the, you know, the principles, if we're doing agriculture, every, all of that is important, but it's not enough. You need to be able to work with others. You need to be able to provide leadership. You need to be able to network. You need to do all of these non-cognitive functions that allow you to get ahead. And so the changing nature is making it so that the type of skills needed are different. Access to finance. Now you think as you get up, you're a young person, you go and you, you want to you know, get a bank account. Even in developed countries, this is difficult. I know I've had to co-sign on my children's, uh, you know, getting them credit. I sign off to make sure they can get credit. And that's an advanced system. But in, a, in these countries, it's very difficult, and they pay, play, have particular financial constraints. Access to land. One in three adults has access to land in developing countries, has, has ownership, clear defined ownership. One in 10 young people. For young women, it's double that, one in 20. Part of the issue is health. People are living longer, which is fantastic but they're not giving their land to the young people. And so we're getting not just fragmentation, but a lack of ownership. So access to land is a particular constraint. And then another huge constraint is gender norms. So, you know, the, the triple challenge, you're rural, which puts you at a disadvantage already. We know poverty rates are much higher. Uh, you're female, which has another set of constraints and you're young. And so, the, some of the, the most difficult stories we hear from uh, in working in the field is from young women. Uh, there was in one of the panels, this young woman talked about how she desperately was trying to get land from uh, within her community. And they basically said, no, you're a woman. You don't get the land. And so she tried to even rent land and they said, no, we can't trust you. And so what she had to do was end up working for a couple more years till she got her own money so she could make the payment. And eventually she did well and she started this business and a few other people are working with her. But you think of all the, all the young women who weren't able to get past that. And so we see that big constraint. And then the next big thing that we have is this dynamic nature of change. We have a demographic transition occurring in a lot of these countries. They're switch, switching from high birth rates to lower birth rates, high death rates to lower death rates. So you have this group of people that come through. Now in the US, we call it the baby boom. So it happens in other countries. And in the US, we talk about a, a demographic dividend. There's that sweet spot where young people enter into the market. There's not too many old people. There's not too many children. And so young people enter the market and you have this big group of workers. It's a huge advantage to an economy. You have less dependency. This is where we're heading in the demographic transition. Now the question is, are we going to give them opportunities to make them workers? Can they get ahead if we, t if we ride this wave of demographic transition, can they get ahead and we can get uh, the demographic dividend? We have climate change. Uh, I'll show you a graph in a minute that climate change is very much linked to youth because agriculture is linked to youth. And of course the digital revolution. Not only does this create all these opportunities, but it creates all these expectations. So young people know what's happening in the world. When my great grandmother left Sweden, she had some vague idea that something was happening over there in America, but it took her you know, a couple months on the boat to get there. Now they know, they've got the smartphone, they can figure it out. 
And that creates all these expectations about the possibilities. So in terms of climate change, what we did is we looked at the percent of GDP from agriculture and the youth as percent of, uh, of total population. And what you find is that countries, as I said earlier, that are most dependent on uh, agriculture are also the ones that have a, a youth, high youth population. If your 20% of your GDP comes from, or higher comes from agriculture, your youth population is around 20%, so one in five people. That is where we expect climate change to be the worst as well. Because agriculture is being affected, is affecting, sorry, climate change is affecting agriculture. In terms of finance, the same issue. What we see is that young people have the potential to get finance through uh, digital technology. And in fact, in poorer countries, the opportunities are greater because you're jumping with the digital divide. But we see youth only slightly exceed adults. Our expectation had been they would be more technologically savvy, but it seems that there's a lot of constraints that keep them from being much ahead. So what does this mean? What do, what do we need to do? So the first is we need cognitive and, co and non-cognitive skills. One of the issues, when you look at all the literature on what works in, in youth training, a lot of programs fail. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is vocational training, when there's no opportunity, doesn't do you a whole lot of good. If I train someone on digital technologies and say, I'm going to give you market information on the price of onions, but you have no market for onions, it's not going to do you a lot. And so we found that there was a lot of programs, particularly in rural areas, that didn't work because uh, they didn't factor in where they were. What we need is to do broader non-cognitive skills, partner with the private sector, and continuous support. Now, as an example, in Cameroon, we have this project, uh, a youth pastoralist project. And what it does is instead of just training, it, it provides an incubator. So you start, we're working with 25,000 youth, and what we're doing is giving them training, but then matching them with someone uh, who has experience with starting businesses. They continue to provide input to that person. In those panels, that's the thing that they say is the biggest problem, is that new problems come up and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond to it. And so by having this mentoring, this incubator, you're constantly allowing them the opportunity to go and ask someone. So the, the capacity building is important. The empowerment. So in El Salvador, uh, one of the things that we've done is we've created this, uh, this National Assembly of Youth. Um, it's 3,000 young people. Uh, they work on youth issues. 60% of them are women. Uh, there's a national indigenous youth uh, group within that. And what their objective is, to, is to be engaged with the government on policies that are linked to youth. We need to make sure that we're addressing the, the issues that young women face in particular and the social norms. One of the things that we're doing uh, is what's called the GALS program, the Gender Action uh, Learning, GALS, learning System, something like that. It uses this approach where you, you train both men and women, about shared prosperity. You talk to both about how the income gains in, for women have benefits for the entire household and that they should work together. So we've done this, and the World Bank just did a, an impact evaluation of this and found that it actually is a very successful uh, approach. So we've done this in 20 programs for over 100,000 people, right? So 50,000 men and women each. Uh, and it's changing those social norms. So these are the types of things that we need to think of. So the main message coming out of this is uh, our three. Rural youth development policy investment should be embedded in broader rural development strategies. Where you are matters, and it makes a big difference about the opportunities. An effective pro program must have the right balance between creating those broader opportunities and fostering youth-specific ones. So you do need to work towards broader opportunities in the rural sector. But you also need to recognize that young people face those particular constraints, the capacity, finance, land, gender issues. And that those policies uh, to foster rural transformation 
need to consider the foundations of this rural development, that it's not just about productivity, which is one of the things that we see. There's this huge focus in these programs on productivity. That's great, but it's not enough. You have to include connectivity and you have to make sure that, that people are feel empowered. And so what should you do? Now, when, there, when you are in a, a country or a part of a country in which there is a low level of development and a low level of rural opportunity, what you want to do is focus on those broader policies. First, you have to create the opportunities and make sure they're youth inclusive because you can also make the mistake of focusing on the broad, broader policies but forgetting that young people should be part of that. And then when you're in a country in which there is or in a part of a country where there's a high level of rural opportunity, you have to have youth specific investments. It's not enough to just do well in the rural economy and just assume young people will be able to take advantage. You have to have those kind of investments that that uh, address some of those specific constraints that young people face. Thanks. Right. Stay here. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I will just have to. Is this on now? I will just use this one. Uh, so now we have uh, two commentators to provide uh, some comments on the report, and I will ask them both to join us here on stage. And uh, we have uh, Jesper Janusson, who's a senior researcher, and then we have Simon Wanke, who is uh, a member and a representative of the Young Swedish Farmers of LRF Youth. So please, join me. And... Uh, I will let you, Simon, start, and then, or we let you, uh, yeah, you start, yes, sorry. Yeah, you start, and then we hear the comments from Singh. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, just check, check, okay. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers for uh, including me in this event, and congratulations to IFAD and uh, the authors for a very well-written and um, thorough, inspiring, and thought-provoking uh, report. Um, as, as uh, Kaisa said, I'm a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute, and my direct experience with uh, policy analysis and policy implementation is quite limited, so I'll draw on my research background to add some comments to some of the guiding themes of this uh, research, rather than trying to speculate about uh, the, the possibilities for implementing this ambitious sort of outline of uh, very broad uh, policies uh, uh, in, in the uh, area of uh, rural youth. Um, I'm currently heading a, a research project on, we're calling it soft infra infrastructures on, of uh, regional labor migration in the wider Sahel region, where we're looking specifically at uh, sort of the non-material uh, facilitators of regional mobility. And here, of course, uh, the movements between uh, urban and rural uh, settings are, are key. So this is an area that I'm trying to learn more about. And this has really been, um, well, a very useful experience for me, so thank you for, for, for that as well. Um, in the kind of research I've been doing, uh, the theme of youth has been a recurrent interest of mine, so I, I'd like to begin by adding some reflections on how to understand the concept of youth, especially coming from a qualitative research background, which is slightly different than, than the main uh, thrust of, of this report. Uh, again, I don't think this challenges uh, the findings or the recommendations of the report, but it might add some nuance to how to think about the idea of youth on a global scale and, and to sort of strike this balance between um, global commonalities and local specificities. So in qualitative research, uh, the, the general definition of youth as an age group is often questioned, which is also acknowledged in this report. And, and again, the report is very clear on its choice of, of delimitation here, so it's not really a critique. But I think that anthropological research does add something to our understanding of what youth is about. Uh, there's a, an argument in uh, Africa-focused research that youth is not an age, it's rather a position, and that people older than the conventional definition of, of youth, so older than 25, may still experience being stuck in a position of dependency, of not being able to become full adults in a meaningful way. Uh, there's a whole literature now on the idea of weighthood, the idea of people waiting to make that transition into adulthood. And here's adulthood also is seen sort of as a social status rather than an 
age uh, category. Um, I think this is important to acknowledge for several reasons, because in the age-based definition of youth, there is a tendency to overlook some of the capabilities of um, those who are categorized as children, for example, people who are under the age of 15 but who have been working for years on the family farm or elsewhere. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, issues relating to workers' rights and the protection of children for that category of people, but I think it is important not just to criminalize or problematize uh, people who are defined as children and their productive role in the household economy, for example. This also means that the, the experiences and the capabilities of so-called children uh, are important to, to tap into as a resource uh, when looking at uh, youth employment uh, opportunities. Uh, at the other end of the scale, people who are in age terms seen as adults, so people who are older than 25, as I said, may be in a position where they're not able to make their own choices. They're not able to break free of the dependency on their, on their elders or their parents. And that raises a whole set of other uh, challenges and, and needs uh, that, that could be taken into consideration here. So thinking broader about the idea of what youth implies, and again, this is coming from a very sort of Africa-focused uh, background, I think is important. Um, I completely acknowledge the need for delimitation. So again, this is not really a critique. It's just sort of a, a, an attempt to nuance uh, uh, the, the approach here. Um, obviously, the idea of what youth implies has also changed over time. For example, in Burkina Faso, where I've done most of my research, you can see that the Ministry for Youth uh, in the 1960s and 70s was called the Ministry for Youth, Leisure and Sports. It then became the Ministry of Youth and Education during the 1980s, and now it's the Ministry of Youth, Work and uh, Employment. And I think this is a general trend, and of course it reflects policy interests uh, uh, both globally and, and nationally, right? So the meaning politically and, and uh, socially of what youth, the role of youth in society is, changes over time. And I think in general there's been this ambivalence about that category. On the one hand, the youth are the future of the nation, right? But at the same time there's been concerns uh, in many places around the world about uh, frustrated youth, angry youth, especially angry young men mobilizing against governments, etc., but also being uh, this force for change and, and, and the challenge to, to uh, uh, geron gerontocratic uh, or sort of elderly-based uh, hierarchies, etc. So, so youth, in, politically speaking, are a quite ambivalent category, and that is important to acknowledge as well, that they are seen as such both locally and in policy terms. Um, so in a similarly vague and, and sort of uh, uh, abstract way, I'd like to just add a few comments on the, specifically on rural-urban linkages, which I think is an important uh, um, uh, phenomenon here that is not lacking as such in the report, but I think that it, it's sort of a, a sphere that, that one could tap into in thinking about creating opportunities for Euro rural youths. Um, the project I'm heading now looks at um, labor mobility in a fairly open-ended sense. Um, what we have seen based on, on the, the research literature is that uh, young people in particular are extremely mobile and that being able to move between rural and urban settings, whether within a country or uh, regionally, is a, a sort of a resource that people tap into. Uh, this is, of course, uh, regulated in very different ways in different regions of the world. And in West Africa, where I have worked mainly, there's a very sort of low degree generally of regulation of regional labor migration or cross-border movement, which means that people can move fairly freely. This means that in West Africa, there's a very low degree of uh, uh, trafficking. Uh, there, it's not that it's absent, but there's sort of less demand for a, a, a sector um, outside official regulation, because there is fairly little of it, right? Uh, in contrast, you might think of the European context, where you have a very high degree of regulation of immigration, which means that uh, uh, entries into Europe are extremely limited at present, and that creates the demand then for other uh, uh, ways of, of entering uh, Europe. So um, regional mobility uh, in, the, in the sort of the... the geographical setting I'm most familiar with is a resource that people do tap into and it is not just 
it is to look up uh, livelihood options across borders, uh, but it is also just to maintain social ties across distances, whether uh, to rural relatives or urban cousins or whatever it might be, uh, but also to, to um, spend time with family members that you do not know in order to expand your social network. And I really appreciate the report's emphasis on uh, connectivity. As an anthropologist, I think primarily of social connectivity that actually uh, uh, youths are not seeking to become independent in the sense of cutting ties to their relatives. Rather, they're seeking to become even more connected to a wider network of socially significant others, right? So youth is a time where you seek out connections rather than cutting ties. Uh, and I think this is sort of implicit in, in the work you're doing, but something that is worth uh, emphasizing. Just as a final uh, aspect, I've already uh, talked quite a lot about uh, mobility and, and migration regulation. Um, but I want to say that, that in the current uh, political and policy climate around migration issues, especially uh, in relation to African migration, I think there is a tendency to, um, while, while I acknowledge the need for, for you know, uh, uh, regulation around immigration into Europe, there's a tendency to see migration and mobility as, a, as something abnormal and so, as something uh, out of uh, something that needs to be sort of mitigated or prevented in different ways. Uh, I think the idea of root causes in current per policy thinking is fundamentally flawed in that sense because it assumes that with increased development people will be less likely to move and I think that's just especially in West Africa fundamentally wrong and I think it might uh, risk us cutting the branch we're sitting on in terms of promising to deliver results that keep people in place while we're actually empowering people to move more. And I think what is needed there is a different way of thinking about what mobility means, especially, of course, uh, uh, at the regional and national level. And, and there, as I've said, mobility is a way of tapping into wider spheres of influence and opportunity. Um, I think I should end there, and I hope that we can continue the discussion. But thank you very much for a, a very interesting report. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for your comments, and I will ask you to, to stay here so we can all be a part of a panel after we hear the, the comments from uh, Simon. And I mean, you're one of the persons that we should thank especially, because you are actually a farmer, and as I said, this is like worst time for a seminar if you want a farmer to participate. But gladly, I read that the, the harvest is good this year oh, in yeah, comparison yeah, is, to, yeah. to last year. So, mm -hmm. but please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for a great presentation, a very interesting report. Uh, I take the microphone is on since nobody's waving at the moment. So I think everything is good. All right. Yeah, as you said, I'm, we're in the middle of harvest. Um, you can tell that from two things, my haircut and my beard. You know, I'm, right now I'm looking mostly like one of our old former kings, Gustav Vasa. Um, so actually, yeah, I stepped out of the combine three hours ago. We we're in the middle, middle of uh, harvesting our winter crop. And um, beside being a farmer or a farm manager, actually, because it's not my family farm, I'm employed as a manager at a large scale farm just about an hour south of this head, capital city here. And um, I'm also the vice president of the Federation of Young Swedish Farmers. And since June this year, I also I'm also entitled in working for European young farmers through the European Council of Young Farmers based in Brussels. So coming down from 780 million young people in rural areas, I represent about 2 million young people in rural areas. And reading the report, the first thing that strikes me is actually, I thought I was the only one who had problems, you know. And then you read the report and you realize that we face a lot of similar things all over the world, looking in rural development and agriculture, specifically. Uh, starting up with, off with what you say, Kaisa, a, long, a lot of young people in rural development countries want to become someone. If you ask me, I stepped into this business to become someone. I stepped into farming to become someone because I see very, very clearly with a lot of colleagues, especially in the Nordic countries, but also all over Europe, that farming is a way to ensure, as written in the report, food security and sustainability. It's a lot of things that can be handled if we farm and take care of the, of the earth in the right way. Um, so, of course, 
I reckon what you say when you say that people, we, we, we sometimes feel neglected because a lot of us young people really, really want to make farming profitable and we want to make a living out of it. Doesn't, and it doesn't really matter if you're a family farmer or if you're employed and the size of the farm doesn't even matter as well. So I'm very, very pleased to read and you spoke about it as well, Jesper. First of all, the three dimensions here. Farming, if you look at generally, it's quite easy. You can learn quite well by yourself how to farm or how to grow crops. That's the easiest thing. You learn by doing. And then, of course, you have to adapt to Mother Nature. But when it comes to managing the farm or managing your business or, or, or even developing or starting a business, that's when you actually need to start receiving knowledge or getting knowledge and being able to adapt to that knowledge and also making sure that you can develop out of it and prosper from it. And that's when we need these people who make decisions to listen to us. So I'm glad to see and read about it in the report. And you can almost, I think, adapt that to every country in the world if you ask young farmers. Though it's the, de the, le the levels are, of course, different. And then with the social thing here, looking at the Federation of Young Swedish Farmers, we have about 17,000 members here in Sweden. And a lot of them are close to larger cities or larger towns where you still have some kind of infrastructure that you can rely on. But a lot of them are also, as, as we spoke about earlier, alone in their business because a lot of the people that they went to school with or who are a lot of people in the same way that they grew up with, they have chosen a total different direction because about, it's just about 2% of the Swedish population that are in farming as a business. So it's quite small here in this country. So a lot of people feel alone and they need someone who actually, who they can, they can work together with when it comes to policy making. So being part of a group, we know that as people in general, we want to be part of, the, part of a group. We don't want to be alone here. And this is where I think we can work much closer as policymakers with us who lobby towards policy, because that's when you kind of know that you're in the right direction or you're moving towards the right decisions if we get listened to. And then we can also adapt to that and work harder for it. And the other thing is also coming back to what I said about farming being an easy thing. Yes, it is. It could be, it can be quite easy to produce crops, uh, but it also has to develop over time. And for us to adapt as farmers to policy making, it takes quite a lot of time. We know that we can produce maybe one or two crops through one, through the, through one year. And then you have to wait another year before you can start over. So if the policies are changed a few times a year or once a year, you never get the chance to kind of adapt and, make, and see if things that you're working by are the right things to do. So of course, we need decisions, we need things to develop, but we also need a chance to adapt to it. And that takes, can take quite, a lot, quite some time. So I just want to close with um, the points that Paul closed his presentation with. Yes, a broader rural development will, of course, be very, very important for young people. And I do hope that we kind of change the trend with our young colleagues in developing countries that they want to become someone and becoming someone means being a farmer because we are very, very important for the world today and of course in the future. So thank you very much for having me and thank you very much for give, giving me a chance. So please, can join me at the Yes, so thank you very much to both of you for these valuable and thoughtful comments. And I will just give you a couple of like an opportunity to uh, say some words. So maybe if you have any, there were no questions, but maybe some reflections on the comments that you that you got. Well, th thanks. I, I actually greatly appreciate the comments because a lot of what you were saying, uh, we had a very d diverse group of researchers. And so we discussed these things every uh, endlessly. What does it mean to be young? 
and it's a social construct. It's not a 15 to 24. And so we, we discussed how we do this. And in the end, I basically said, we have to quit discussing this because I have to write a report, so we're going to use the UN definition. <laughs> but it, it's important that it, it, it should be viewed more broadly than that. It's just at some point, you do need numbers. You need to put those things uh, forward. So I greatly appreciate it. Actually, a lot of the comments that you made were the, part of the discussions we had. So it was good to have everyone hear that. Um, and I also uh, greatly appreciate your comments. You know, the last rural development report um, was on uh, rural transformation, and we presented this here, and we had a representative, uh, a more senior colleague, uh, come, <laughs> uh, and also talked about the same kind of challenges, and that one of the things to, to remember is that this is across many countries, the challenges that are, are, are being faced. And your statement about young people and the importance of young people uh, in farming uh, is is critical, and one of the things that we as uh, as international development agencies may need to also change the narrative that we provide around farming. I was at one event in Kigali, and this young woman stood up and held up uh, you know held up this report and basically said, "You, I was there with FAO with the government, said you guys are most of the problem. Look at this," and she showed a picture of another agency's uh, cover, and it said. Look who's on this. And it was this elderly woman. She was producing maize. She did not look like she was very well off. And, and she was basically saying, you guys are perpetuating an image of farming as being a backward uh, you know, industry to be in. And you guys need to change the way you do things. Uh, and, and she basically you know, put us on the spot. And, uh, and she was right. And I do think that needs to change. And there was an article in the New York Times a couple months ago that talked about making agricultural sexy in Africa, and I do think that that's one of the keys, that we need to change the way it's viewed. It's a business, it's a way to make money, it's the potential future, and we need to make sure that that message is clear from, from us as well. So, thank you. Yeah. A couple of years ago, we had a high-level politician saying that we had to ta make uh, paying taxes sexy. So maybe now it's time for the making agriculture sexy and the rural areas sexy again also in Sweden. So we have uh, some time for questions and comments from the, uh, from the audience. We have Katarina here who will run around with the microphone. And I ask you to wait until she is with you with the microphone since it's being filmed so that colleagues uh, elsewhere also can hear what you're saying. And please also start by saying your name and where you're coming from so we know who's, who's talking. I don't know, maybe does Esse from, uh, from CEDA, do you want to, to say something? I mean, I think we're all curious to know, for example, how this is being interpreted by CEDA. What do we take with us in terms of Swedish development cooperation from, from the key and the main conclusions from, from this report? Thank you very much. Is this on? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. I very much want to Do we need to uh, 
that the, the, the young people as individuals, it's a very diverse group. We have young women, we have uh, young men, and we have people living uh, off the land, and we have people living urban areas of the cities, and to what extent do we need to look at different uh, groups of them? And, and I think it's also important to highlight opportunities for those who are seeking opportunities in the industry. How do we do that? Uh, so those are just a uh, couple of uh, I'd like to uh, uh, hear some of your responses, but also uh, to be a lot but I think I will let you 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 reply first, Paul, and then. So, uh, uh, EFED for a while has recognized that rural economies are transforming, and so that requires that you have projects that that recognizes that value chains are becoming important. So, seventy percent of our projects have value chain components to it, meaning that we're trying to not just improve production but link small scale producers to market. A lot of how we do that is by organizing farmers so they can meet the quality timing standards that are, are needed in the market. Um, what we've realized though that that's not enough and we have to engage more directly into the private sector. Um, we uh, have helped support what's called the Agribusiness Capital Fund, uh, which is based out of uh, Luxembourg. Um, it's got money from the EU and others, and we're, we're trying to build up that fund. Now, that fund's focusing on investments that are between 50,000 and a million. And one of the criteria is uh, whether we can get young people to uh, include it in those projects. And so that has to be considered as we're doing that. So from 50 to 250,000, we're mostly going through other financial intermediaries to provide funding potentially directly to young entrepreneurs. Then from 250 to a million, uh, we're looking at more smaller enterprises. Now, the reason for that is you do have financial institutions like the International Finance Corporation, which will provide really large loans to the private sector. You have microfinance that provide you know, smaller scale loans, and there's this big gap in between the funding. Uh, and the hope is, is that by taking this kind of approach, is that you're providing funny funding for more local enterprises and enterprises at the, at the smaller scale um, that will will be able to build up over time. So we're we're moving into that space. We have a, a private sector strategy going to the to our board actually in a few weeks, um, and we our governing council just allowed this last uh, February us to start directly providing funds to the the private sector. So we're trying to identify ways to both directly and also assemble finance from others uh, to to work more with getting the private sector grow. Now, we're able to do that because we start at the farm level and are trying to, to work up rather than starting at a, a higher level and, and work down. Um, in terms of the, the young people as individuals, it, it's, it's a very good point. And it was, again, something we talked about a lot. And so one of the questions is, is, is what makes them different? And part of what we, uh, we came to uh, is a lot about where they are. Um, this hasn't been talked about a lot, is that you, and partly because we didn't have the kind of data that's available, this geographic data, uh, where they are relative to urban areas matters a great deal. Uh, the household that they're in matters a great deal. And so we talked, we, we went through, and of course their gender, uh, other character, indigenous background, et cetera. So we did uh, recognize all of that. The hard, the challenge of that is that you, you, you have general policies even though you have individuals. So how do you try to create broader policies uh, that creates the opportunities that you that you're you're talking about, and so one of the the keys for us is to try to make sure that the general environment is, is good, so you have opportunities in general, but then try to target as much as you can the individual constraints that that are faced by by different groups in that area. So it's it's trying to do both at the same time. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? It could be to any of the of the three people. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for the presentation. And uh, a stepping stone is business, as you mentioned, as a farmer. And you uh, rely very much as being a member of a group. I wonder if you had in your study and research any insight with cooperatives 
younger people that gather together and start a cooperative as a business idea to uh, be stronger and to get into production. Any talk about cooperatives in your study? Mm -hmm. Yes. You can yeah, so, so the the basic kind of model of EFAD is to to organize farmers. So uh, partly because of their scale, uh, the ones we work with, it's hard for them to get the critical mass that requires them to get into the market. And so a starting point is to to organize them both to transfer technology, but also so that they can reach that scale. So one of the things that we 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 see uh, in the evidence is. Uh, how that helps in terms of linking the value chain. So we see that. What's less apparent in the evidence is getting young people in there. So our approach has mostly been trying to expand that organization so young people can be more and more involved. With these, some of these new approaches, we're trying to focus on young entrepreneurs that, that work together and uh, you know, incubate their work and that they're hiring other young people. Um, we still need to develop more evidence on that. It seems to be, it's, you know, anecdotally, we see a lot of examples of it working. Um, you know, there, there's an example in Cameroon, in a young man in our project is selling, uh, he's selling chicken to Hilton, uh, the hotel I actually stayed at. Um, and what, what he's doing, though, is uh, he's using his social capital, his link back to his own communities, and they trust him. And so he figures out what the market needs. And he's on his phone constantly because he's sending back messages about when, who has to do what, when. And a lot of them are other young people because they understand the technology, they get the, the. And so in effect, he's created this, it's not a formal cooperative, it's an informal association of young people that are working together I, and older people as well. But I asked him about it and he said, a lot of times the, the, it's, the child of a farmer who's actually doing a lot of the work, but the communication's going through the young person because they're on the phone and they can text faster. Uh, and so you, you get these kind of anecdotes, but I do think we need to spend some time uh, understanding a bit better how well this works and, and building off of it. This, this push has only been, at least at EFAD in the last couple of years when Gilbert uh, came along and one of the, the first things are, in our first conversation said, we're going to be focusing on youth more. Uh, and uh, and we started thinking about it. And it turned out internally at EFAD, there was this huge appetite for it as well. Uh, and so we were pushing, we have an action plan, and so we're trying to do this, but we do need to generate more evidence about it. Combining it with mentoring. That's part of the incubator model, yeah. Right. So that's what we're trying to, that's try, well, again though, this is something that's expanding. There's some evidence from other organizations that it does work, but it's we're taking it to a bigger scale, and so you need to always check to see can you do that and can it be successful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Eva? You should jump in if you want to say something. Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah, it is. Okay. Eva uh, Olsson, I'm at the Research Corporation uh, Unit here at CIDA. And uh, my question is related to this making agriculture more sexy. I mean, we could. <laughs> Um, I, I'm wondering how EFAD is working with like artificial intelligence or um, these new things that young people um, are, they are more prone to think that that's more interesting to work, right? having drones and that, you know, precision agriculture and all this. Okay, and even in, even in, in lower income countries, they, they work with these things. So I'm wondering how are you linking up with the universities? Sweden uh, supports a lot of the university and research capacity mm -hmm. at universities in lower income countries. Um, could EFA link up with them? Um, and then are you also linking up with the CGIR system and uh, um, they're working on, on um, extending this kind of agriculture and results that they are um, uh, produced? Yeah. So, so we, pro we let me start with the end part. Uh, we. We provide a, a great deal of funding to the CG system and have historically through our grants. We also manage funds from the European Commission uh, for the CG system for support. So they've just given us 30 million more to basically distribute to the CG system for the types of projects that would like that uh, could feed into our projects. Um, in terms of technology, I th uh, we are trying to do more of that. Um, unfortunately, it has been a little ad hoc. It, it depends on you know who uh, who's managing the project and how much they're they're uh, how interested they are. 
And so we're, we're trying to systematize that. So actually last night I read our, RC, our ICT 4D uh, strategy, which is going to be going to our board. So what we're trying to do is collect all of that and to do a better job. And part of it is exactly to try to address the issue that there is a recognition that we need to push the technologies further. And there's lots of examples, you know, in Nigeria, they have, I can't remember the name, uh, the Uber, the tractor Uber, um, uh, whatever the name of it is. Um, and, uh, it, and within our projects, that's, that's being used. So we, we have all these examples anecdotally, but we don't have enough systemization of it. Uh, and so now we're trying to systematize it precisely for the reasons that you're saying. Well, you may, um, there is also intention yeah. that we see uh, that is, we we that we see in the, the fact that there is a demand of what I would, I would term kind of second level technology, meaning that for the small holders, for some of the companies that are really behind, they don't need to be what they, they they're not looking to say with the the latest um, high tech technology. Even by having the kind of the, what I call the, the not the business class, even by being in the economy and class of technology, the impact um, on on the, the productivity and the access to the market is already high. Then the the, the the second dimension, the more you are able now to push to, for the business class um, technology, the more we also have in public, uh, you remember the one of things that Paul has been pushing for is to also um, look at that small order that is not necessarily at the bottom up, but that is kind of one step up, so they can have a pull factor and cause more of an economic uh, growth with the highest technology. And that sometimes is also go with the kind of the low, uh, the low income countries, some of them, a lot of them are the, the lower middle income countries where you can see that uh, um, we have a perfect example was the, uh, the case in the uh, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, where by um, encouraging the cooperative or associations, um, having the example of a, a joint financing to, to have the, the drones, has pushed the kids coming back from the state, from the United States, and to take up the succession of the farm. Thank you for that addition. Uh, yep. Uh, so um, the, the mitigation issue is, is a big issue, and, um, and this last, uh, we, we have these three-year replenishment cycles where we get funding, uh, and this last replenishment cycle, uh, one government uh, called Sweden um, <laughs> put a lot of pressure on us to address the issue that you, uh, you are talking about, and I had numerous phone calls directly with your government to, uh, to discuss this. And so... Uh, which was good because it actually nudges in the direction. We'd had a lot of internal discussions about this anyway, and so it kind of nudges us along to, to think about it more carefully. And so we are doing that more. Um, 
and there are technologies out there uh, that we're trying to figure out how we can use them to address the mitigation issue a little bit uh, more carefully. Um, there's, you know, uh, there's uh, in dairy production, there's things that you can do to reduce emissions while increasing productivity. And in fact, I've met with the International Livestock Research Institute, one of the CG, to talk about how we can do this. Um, so there are there, there are things that we're we're trying to do. I um, mean, for every country, uh, we do the, the the nationally determined contributions, right? We do an analysis of the country and how. Uh, they can contribute um, and what our role in that is going to be. So we are doing that and, and have individual technologies we're trying to use. So it is something we're, um, we're talking about. The, in terms of the double and triple burden, um, this, uh, I find this household methodology is quite interesting if you can manage it. The challenge is doing it at scale. Um, because, uh, you know, we have projects in the Ministry of Agriculture, right? We're working on value chains, and now you're going and telling some agronomist he's got to go talk to men and women about intra-household dynamics and how men and women can work together. Mm -hmm. But when you get it right, you're actually addressing a lot of sim issues simultaneously. T simultaneously. So you're, you're addressing a lot of those issues of potentially being young, of being a woman in the household. And the whole logic of it is shared prosperity. Right, so if all of you, if if you have these constraints, you know, raising children, all of those, how do you work together and convincing both the men and women working together, they actually get a bigger pie. And there's, you know, these things that, these visuals they use which show them how this this works. Um, and, and I do think it has the potential to address that. Uh, again, the hard part is trying to mainstream this into our, our projects because it's a, it's a social approach and we're dealing with uh, agriculture production. Now we should do it because you are creating a bigger pie, right? If you're building the value chains, you're increasing income. That's mm -hmm. great. And so there's opportunity there. It's easier to, to cut, it's, it's harder to cut up the same size pie than one that's growing. Mm -hmm. And so as it's growing, it's a good opportunity, it's, but it's not a trivial undertaking. So right now we're doing within projects, but usually with only a share of the farmers because it's hard to kind of take it to big scale. And it's hard to get governments to borrow for these things because they're not convinced yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, even a grant element might be better for this type of thing rather than the loans, which we normally give. Thank you. Now we have uh, three people on the list and we have three minutes. So I will ask the three people to, 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 to ask their questions on it, and then you will get the chance to comment on all of them at the same time because we're a bit short of time and we're at the end of the day so people probably have things to go to, homes and, and children and, and everything after this. So first, uh, gentleman over there, yes. And please be brief in your questions as well. Speak up a bit. Access to information. And for example, in Somalia, a lot of farmers, most of them, they do not have access to Let's just say, information that is useful for their production. So, what we do is we give a community study that we uh, look how can the smartphone can be used to uh, use in areas where there's no agriculture. So what we uh, get is uh, mostly small farmers, some of them still already have a smartphone and they use it as part of them. And for instance, if a farmer has a smartphone and can take a picture or a lot of media and send it for some of them, or whatever it's there, then that can have a good potential impact. Thank you. And Mats? <coughs> my name is Mats. What my role for is Swedish Institute uh, for Aid Studies, the GPA. Uh, I don't know why I find myself in this situation of uh, asking a detailed question which contains a very huge uh, question. <laughs> uh, I found the, this uh, figure of yours uh, on, in the report about. Well, mobile money uh, used by youth and used by, by uh, adults. And, uh, it turns out that in, in those countries that are most important, the, the uh, little, little structural transformation, high uh, transformation, and low, low uh, 
there is a huge software for one month. Like if it's not free, they are not by the adults, indicating that you might have a problem with uh, sort of the take up of, of technology if this is indicating something more than just your uh, mobile money. Uh, so my question is, is it indicating something more? And um, do you know anything why we have this situation of, of not more youth taking on these technologies? Mm -hmm. And then the colleague next to you. So you spoke about identifying farmers and this idea that they feel neglected and that they want to make farming profitable. What policies would you like to see that include youth more just developing in this change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll start with, uh, with you and yeah, so, so the access to information uh, is critical, and not just market information, information on what's happening with climate, uh, information on where you can actually get to market. So I, I do think that's a very important thing that kept coming through uh, in, the, in the analysis we're doing. On this particular issue, to be quite frank, our expectation was not to get that result. Uh, we expected to see um, that there would be more access among young people, and there's not uh, the data doesn't support that young people are adopting technologies a lot more, a little bit more, but not a lot more. Uh, and we were surprised. Um, and we're still not 100% sure, but it's good data, so it's, it's not a, a data problem. So part of it is, do they face more constraints in accessing the actual mobile phones? Uh, and so that was one thing we debated, but it's hard to tell that from the kinds of data that we have. Um, but in a, you go to farm families and it's quite often they just have one phone and that's whoever's considered the head of household manages it. And so that, that's potentially one of the issues that they don't have their own phone and so they're not getting it. But it is uh, a question that we're not sure why. The fact that in low transformation there's more uh, mobile phone use, that actually has to do with basically the, the, the formal system is so messed up, both for finance and for telephones, landlines, that they're going around, they're jumping over the technology in these places. And so they tend to use them more because they have such a weak institutions to begin with. And so that wasn't too much of a surprise. But in general, in the technology, we did not find uh, the expectation that young people were had used more technology, all of those things. Uh, it, it wasn't as clear in the data as we had expected, so it's something that we need to probably consider a bit more. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I have limited time as well, so I'm going to pick, I think, one of the most important ones that I see, which is making generational renewal accessible as talking about access to land, that somebody actually is, is prepared to, to let you take over the farm. And I think a lot of things, uh, a lot of the times there, the person who is actually going to give the farm away to the next generation or sell the farm or whatever, making sure that they are that they they can do that because a lot of people have invested their whole time, all their time, all their money, their whole life in the farm. So how are we going to make these people able to give the farm to the next generation? What are they going to live out from? If you look at Sweden, for me to to buy a farm from a person who has invested their whole life in that farm, that's a lot of money. Uh, so much money, you, you can, sometimes you can't even imagine where you're going to would come up with that money. And you, as well, you know the person that is going to give the farm away, they won't do that for less money because they have to survive as well. So making the generational renewal there accessible to both sides, mm -hmm. that is something that governments need to think about, I think, when they make policy. Thank you. thank you. I will also let uh, Jesper say some final words before we close. All right. Well, thank you. Actually, that would have been a much more appropriate concluding comment, I think. But <laughs> I just want to perhaps say, build on that to say that um, we've been talking here about two kinds of change that young people are, as we all are, dealing with. One is the challenges of dramatic transformations in, in uh, the environment, but also in uh, the de demo uh, demographic changes in different regions, etc. So change as a challenge. But there's also a long history in social policy, not just in north-south relations, to expect young people to be the drivers of social change, of uh, you know realizing all the hopes we have for, for our collective future. And I think that 
um, that is important. And again, I think this, the report strikes a good balance between a lot of different things. Uh, so I'm not, this is not a critical comment either, but I think it's important also to acknowledge the intergenerational connections that are the foundation of many young people's lives. It's not sort of a competition necessarily between generations, but I think that there is a need to acknowledge the, 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 the sort of the, the resources that the older generation possess, but also the, the mutual wish for collaboration and for passing on the torch to the next generation. So, you know, there's not just I think an overemphasis on young people as the drivers of dramatic revolutionary change does a disfavor to people who are already in a, in a challenging position. So that balance, I think, is important to strike as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think yeah, we, we should have ended five minutes ago, and we're really happy that you, you're all still here, and there will be some, some coffee and some, some nice fruits that you can all take and, and, and have a chat to ask the questions and make the comments that we weren't able to, to make or ask here in the room. I think it will be also be interesting for, I see many people working in the development field in different ways in Sweden, so I think it, this is also a really important report for all of us, how we take this with us. Uh, the group that we are mostly working with are in the low structural transformation, in the corner of low structural transformation and low rural transformation. And we have quite a specific group here, and I also think quite a strong policy recommendation from the, from the report that we need to work more strongly on general rural policies with youth included and taken into account. So I hope that this will also contribute to, to more focus on rural areas, but also better, better work from all of us in terms of quality and focusing on, on inclusion of youth. So on behalf of SIDA, IFAD and Siani, I would like you to thank you all for, for coming and uh, yeah, looking forward to our future work together. And thank you to... <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. We should have, should have uh, contacted you when we were doing the